Good evening all. Most respected Professor Siddharth Ramachandran, Higher Dimensional Photonics Laboratory, Boston University, USA. <coughs> Most respected Professor Unnikrishnan Ayers, Professor Vishnu Pipal, Humberto Cabrera, Kamarjit Singh, Professor VP Nambudi, members of Raman International Electronic Society, Rios, friends, organizing committee members, students, and esteemed participants of the webinar. Gaining impetus from the incessant support and overwhelming participation we received from the Global Opera Electronics Fraternity to Raman Optronic Webinar Series, ROSE, since 2020, RIOS is organizing the third virtual international conference, ROSE 2022, from 7th November 2022 to 7th December 2022. All the webinars in ROSE 2022 are scheduled at 7 p.m. on all working days between November 7th to December 7th with the same Google link. Today is a very special day to us, the people working in optoelectronics and physics. The birthday of the legend Sir C. V. Raman. We all know about him. The inaugural lecture of Rose 2022 will be a Raman Memorial Lecture. We are fortunate to have Professor Siddharth Ramachandran, an eminent professor, as the speaker. Rios was formed with the mission of global interaction and sharing of knowledge in photonics, optoelectronics, and optical communication, with a mission to provide a platform to bridge the gap between academia and industry through collaborative research, webinars, and research paper presentations. <clears throat> Behind every success story, there lies the story of teamwork and perspiration. The credit of the success of previous roles goes to the trio, Dr. Emma Sopna, Dr. Rajiv K. Dhaman, and Ms. Jumna Muhammad Ibrahim. Now we have expanded Rio's by incorporating eminent professors and scientists across the world in organizing and advisory committee. I would like to thank all the organizing committee members for their effort in materializing ROSE 2022, the webinar series lasting for one month. The conference aims to provide a platform for young minds to bridge the gap between academia and industry and to showcase their innovations through research paper presentations scheduled during the first week of December 2022. I request your active participation by submitting research papers to the conference. Rose webinars are blessed by the very participation of the giants in optoelectronics, not only as speakers, but also as participants. I would like to thank the speakers of previous Rose webinars and organizing committee members of Rio's for introducing new faces in Rose 2022. Considering the overall participation and acceptance to the webinar, we are giving live streaming in YouTube and also in our YouTube channel, Raman Optronics. The lectures of the stalwarts of ROSE 2020 and 2021 are available in the YouTube channel Raman Optronics. I request all of you to subscribe to the channel for viewing the previous webinars. Now, there are more than 1,000 registrations to ROSE. Those who haven't yet registered are requested to complete the registration form through the link given in the chat box for getting the update of future webinars and ROSE membership certificate. Today, we are fortunate to have an eminent researcher Professor Siddharth Ramachandran, Boston University, USA, with us as the speaker. We are thankful to you, sir, for accepting our invitation to the webinar. On behalf of the organizing committee and all the members of RIOS, I welcome Professor Siddharth Ramachandran to the webinar series. On behalf of RIOS, I welcome the distinguished professors, researchers, students, and all those who join now to the first webinar in ROS 2022. We request your wholehearted support and participation throughout the program and to make this a grand memorable event. Thank you. Now I invite Dr. Emma Sopna, University of Nova Gorisa, to introduce the speaker. Thank you, sir. I'm very delighted and happy to introduce Professor Siddharth Ramachandran. Professor Siddharth Ramachandran started his career at Bell Labs and after a decade in industrial research labs, returned to academia as a member of the faculty at Boston University. He is currently a distinguished professor of engineering at High Dimensional Photonics Lab, Boston University, USA. His work on the understanding and development of light wave devices 
comprising spatial, vectorial, and topological complexity have been applied in the fields of quantum computing, optical networks, brain imaging, as well as laser-based defense systems. For his contributions, he has been named a distinguished member of technical staff at OFS, FL of Optica, IEEE SPY, and APS, and IEEE Distinguished Lecturer, a distinguished visiting fellow of the UK Royal Society of Engineering, and Vannevar Bush Faculty Fellow. He has authored more than 400 international journal publications and also serves the optics and photonics community in several capacities, including currently as a deputy editor for Optica. On behalf of all the members of REALS, I welcome you, sir, to this webinar. And I also welcome all the invited guests and participants to our first webinar. A humble request to all the participants, all are requested to keep your microphones muted till the end of the webinar. After the talk, time will be given for interaction with the speaker. Also, all of you please take care not to present your screen in between, and link for generating e-certificates and providing feedback will be given at the end of the webinar. Everyone, please fill that. Now I kindly request Professor Siddharth Ramachandran to start the presentation. OK, um, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And, uh, and, and also, more importantly, thank you for, to the organizing committee, and especially Professor Shankar Raman for this uh, uh, very exciting invitation. I, uh, when I accepted this invitation, I actually did not uh, uh, realize that it was uh, Sir C.B. Raman's uh, birth centenary, and so this makes it even more special for me. Um, uh, the fact that uh, the uh, the topic that I want to talk about uh, relates to Raman scattering. So let me actually jump in directly. Uh, I hope uh, you can see my uh, screen in in presentation mode. If you can see it, then it says new Raman scattering selection rules with singular light. Um, Raman scattering is, of course, a very well-known uh, uh, process because of this great man's discovery in the 1930s, for which he won the Nobel Prize in the 1930. And if we want to jump into it and try to understand why it was so important, other than the fact that it was a fundamental new form of uh, light scattering that people found, um, it was it was interesting and it was important. It was highly applicable. Uh, for some reasons, because of, of, of this energy level diagram, which effectively says that um, depending on the vibrational states of, 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 of different energy levels in an atom or a molecule, whether they be the ground state or an excited state, um, light can exchange energy with the phonons or with the lattice vibrations as a result change its color. And this is very interesting and became highly applicable for this very simple reason that these vibrational states are very very different even for exactly the same chemical compositions of, of molecules which means that just by doing laser probing i can measure for instance if i have let me try to see if i can turn my pointer on if i have a laser at, at, at a particular color if i just happen to look at the color at which I get some kind of Stokes emission, this scattered light, then I immediately know what the structure of that element is. And, and that is the real power of this. That is what has made your Raman scattering ubiquitous. That's what has made spectroscopy so easy for us um, and has, 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 has made it really one of the most important tools in uh, the field of optics and non-inner optics. So, if we try to dig in a little bit deeper and 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 uh, and ask this question as to, um, of course, this is the molecular origin. This is what Raman had found. But very quickly, uh, one also realized that this spontaneous process can also be stimulated. And if you stimulate it, then um, the Raman scattering process kind of looks like this, where I have P stands for pump. This is the K vector of the pump and this is the k vector of the uh, of the stokes wave k vector is basically you know your 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 propagation constant or momentum vector of light or anything you want to call it and we immediately see that um the k vector of the scattered photon and the pump photon are quite different which means that i need some kind of a wave vector mismatch uh, i have a wave vector mismatch that i need to fix that i need to somehow control um in a sense, this is what happens in all of nonlinear optics. In nonlinear optics, I have one color that can convert into another color. And in order to do this properly, 
I need to be able to do this phase mismatch. And the reason why Raman is so ubiquitous, and now in the non interoptics language, we could say, is because this phase mismatch is provided by a lattice vibration. And lattice vibration is a phonon whose momentum is much, much larger than the momentum of a photon. So any orientation of this vibration, any orientation of this phonon k vector will essentially give me a projection that can do phase matching. OK, so what does this mean? Long story short, this means that Raman scatterings appears to be to first order, completely insensitive to phase. It does not depend on phase of any kind. And, and, and that's why it's a good thing, because if it doesn't depend on phase, then that means it de doesn't depend on the angle at which I come into the molecule. It doesn't depend on the angle at which I look for Stokes light out of the molecule, which is why it was such a useful spectroscopy tool. It would be very hard to do spectroscopy if I needed to know in advance what angle to look for, because then that defeats the purpose, because that angle depends on the materials, crystal structure, et cetera, et cetera. Then that would become like black scattering, right? So this was the great benefit of Raman scattering. And, and so its strength really depends only on the intensity rate, the, the, the intensities, the in the the uh, the, the you know, intensity spatial structure of the two beams, the pump beam and the Stokes beam. And 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 that is our understanding of Raman scattering. And I wanted to spend this much amount of time going through what I will apologize in advance is obviously a very simple and, and well-known thing, because that's kind of what I want to append today by looking at it in a little more detail. Um, but let's continue with Raman scattering right now. Let's look at it in glass, for instance, in silica glass. Uh, Raman scattering is highly uh, broad because it's an amorphous material. And we typically find that they, you know, um, uh, we get a peak at around 13 terahertz. So if I pump, let's say, some uh, a silica fiber where light can stay uh, in the fiber for a very long time, uh, then I can not only get pump and uh, Stokes emission at 13 terahertz away, this can act like a pump and I can get another uh, Stokes emission and that can act like another Stokes emission, et cetera, et cetera. So as long as I have a long enough pulse, I can get these discrete energy transfers. And this is kind of, you know, uh, again, a well-known aspect of it. In fact, this discrete energy transfer depends only on that overlap integral, uh, was very nicely illustrated by the fact that, uh, I don't know why my Sorry, yeah, for some reason my uh, um, space bar isn't working. Yeah, so this discrete transfer, uh, here's an example of a crazy amount of discrete transfer that happened in a silica fiber. And because each of these peaks depends on the overlap integral in an optical fiber, if I look at all of these peaks, then, you know, I get the speckle pattern. But if I go to individual peaks, I get different modes out of it. And this was this classic experiment that was done by uh, Mafis and Agarwal's group a few years ago. But again, this essentially follows the rule that we have already made for Raman scattering, which is that it depends only on intensity overlap integrals, doesn't depend on phase. OK, um, one more thing I want to, uh, uh, to, to mention as a means of background is, uh, is Raman scattering in the presence of ultra-fast pulses. OK, so if I have an ultra-fast pulse, something that, uh, let's say, is of the order of hundreds of femtoseconds, then that should also give me Raman scattering uh, 13 terahertz away to another ultra-fast pulse. But this actually doesn't happen because ultra-fast pulses, due to group velocity dispersion, uh, move at different velocities, especially when they're one stroke shift apart and they walk away. Uh, let me run that simple animation again. They walk away, which means that I cannot get Raman uh, buildup Raman scattering, strong Raman scattering for ultra-fast pulses. And instead, what ends up effectively happening is a continuous energy transfer process where the red side of the pulp pumps the, um, uh, the sorry, the blue side of the pump, pump uh, pumps the red side of the pump, and the soliton itself shifts as a function of wavelength. This was an effect called soliton cell frequency shifting that was performed by Mitchke and Molenauer back in the 80s, which is another classic way by which one uh, achieves Raman scattering, which is effectively to say for long pulses, Raman scattering is discrete, doesn't depend on phase, just depends on intensity profiles. For short pulses, it again doesn't depend on phase, depends only on intensity profiles, but it 
doesn't give you this discrete transfer, only gives you this seeded, self seeded uh, process by which I can get new colors or some kind of a nonlinear transfer. That brings me to today's talk. Um, those were the, that was the background uh, for Raman scattering. So now let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Uh, specifically, we would like to look at it in 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 light beams which have spatial structure either in terms of phase singularities or polarization singularities and such beams are typically called higher order modes in fibers they can also exist in free space but we'll talk about fibers mainly because in fibers if i can somehow create them and stably excite them and and propagate them then i might be able to see some kind of a coherent process and that's the coherent set of processes that we've been studying for over a decade in our lab. And today, what I want to tell you about is uh, two specific manifestations of these coherent processes, which involve Raman scattering. So let's jump right in. Here's a simple step index multimode fiber. You can go to Thor Labs and buy this fiber. I can solve the modes in this fiber. I get this nice Gaussian mode. But of course, like any uh, two-dimensional uh, system, I can get all these other modes also in this system. Uh, the main point I want to I want you to uh, to recognize is that this is a cylindrically symmetric system, so I have modes which have diversity in radial order and modes that have diversity in the azimuthal order. So azimuthal order is typically called L, radial order called M doesn't matter that nomenclature uh, is not very important but the point is these are the kind of modes that one gets out of well, an optical fiber you just solve any waveguide textbook it gives you these fibers of course we all know that linear combinations of these are also eigenstates in any system so we could have equivalently written in a, written in in another eigenbasis uh, that eigenbasis is called the orbital angular momentum eigenbasis or it could also be the vector mode eigenbasis Let's skip that for now to today and let's look at the orbital angular momentum basis. And here what we find is all modes are cylindrically symmetric. They can have polarization. Sigma stands for uh, X plus IY cap or X minus IY cap. So left circular polarization and right circular polarization. And the key is these modes all have a helical phase E to the IL phi, which essentially tells me that each of these photons in this kind of a mode carries orbital angular momentum of integer values of L, okay? So this is what we know about optical fibers. All There are all these crazy similar modes that exist in fibers. All the Raman scattering rules I told you about so far did not seem to depend on the phase. So that means they should not depend on orbital angular momentum. They should be hey, very nice and benignly. And that's basically the question we're asking today, whether that's true or not. But before we go there, um, we have to solve one problem with these fibers and these modes. We know that this, you can open any textbook and it'll tell you these are all the modes that exist in an optical fiber. But we also know that when we try to put any one mode into this fiber, we get this mess of a speckled pattern that propagates as it goes in the fiber. Why? Because all these modes mix with each other. And in the end, I can't really identify a specific orbital angular momentum or specific singularity, at least when I send light through an optical fiber. I should also point out that what I said may be specific to optical fibers, but the same is true in, in free space and in microscopes and in, in, in other free space bulk media also, simply because if you have an exotic mode uh, that will undergo turbulence and turbulence based mode mixing is essentially the same thing as mode mixing in optical fibers. But that's an aside, let's get back to uh this mixing problem that i said um i want to remove this mixing problem because like i said the whole point of this talk is to look at these specific singular states and see if there's some benefit to them or some kind of uh, a new selection rule that one can uh, garner for them uh, but they, if they mix then everything is lost so if i go and look at perturbation theory that tells me how or why they mix then i immediately find out that this mixing is really a very strong function of the effective index difference or the propagation constant difference between these modes when they're very close they have similar phase velocities so that means they get to interact a lot and they mix so it sounds like a simple way to take care of this is to essentially design fibers where this delta nf is increased and so the mode coupling decreases okay so let's go and do that 
Um, and, 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 and this is my fun part of the talk where I want to tell you that uh, we didn't actually have to design this. Nature gave us the design. And uh, to, give, to, to, to explain what I mean by that, uh, let's go back to a very simple particle in a box problem that we have all solved in our undergraduate textbooks. From that, we know that if we solve for the energy levels of the electron, then as I go to higher and higher order states, the spacing, energy spacing between the states becomes larger. Well, uh, optics, uh, at least uh, a scalar optics, looks very much like uh, uh, the wave mechanics of, uh, of quantum mechanics, as long as I'm looking at the time independent Schrodinger equation. And again, lo and behold, as I go to higher and higher order states, I get greater and greater spacing. So that means that all we need to do is to operate in very high order modes. And that's the counterintuitive parts. We have always assumed that multimode fibers are unstable. And so that would only mean that if I go to higher and higher order modes, that means it's more multimoded and things would be more unstable. Here, what this picture essentially tells us is that if you go to high enough mode orders, then things actually become stable again because the delta nip increases with mode order. And indeed, this is what we had found more than a decade ago. And since then, uh, a lot of groups have been using it to essentially create very higher order states, either in simple step index fibers or polymer clad fibers, or even air clad uh, microstructure fibers. The idea is the same. All of them are essentially an index boundary, a sharp index boundary, and that's all you need in order to guide these modes. OK, so that was the radial order. Remember, I told you there's a radial and the azimuthal order. So now let's look at the azimuthal order. And again, let's make uh, an analogy with uh, what we know from atomic physics, because we know so much about how electron wave functions behave. Uh, again, this is my same uh, um, uh, time-independent Schrodinger equation. And here's the counterpart, the optical waveguide uh, equation that I showed you. But this time, I'm going to look at the L index, which is the other azimuthal index. Well, that's essentially orbital angular momentum in, in, in an electron. And we all know that different energy states um, depend on the angular momentum of, of, of the electron. But in atomic physics, we also know of this very uh, important interaction called the spin orbit interaction, which says that depending on the spin of the electron and the orbital angular momentum, depending on the signs of the two, I'll get an energy splitting. So we should expect the same thing for optics too, because after all, we've already established that the equations are identical. And indeed, that's true, because so far I cheated here by showing you this wave equation. The real wave equation is one that in, includes polarization. And in the moment I include polarization, we find that indeed every one of these orbital angular momentum states splits into two. So why is this important? Because this classic spin orbit interaction induced LS splitting, can now I can now actually exactly physically intuitively predict what that leads to in effective index spacing. And remember, effective index is what gives me stability. And what we effectively again find is just like in the other case with radial order modes, if I go into high enough L modes in a step index fiber, then I should be able to get stable orbital angular momentum modes. So um, that essentially is an idea that led to um, an explosion of interest in this field over the last decade, mainly because now you can get as many as 60 modes out of this. You can go to very high mode orders. You can transmit them long distances with low loss. So there's a serious effort in trying to use these kind of modes to scale uh, modal capacity in optical fibers. But that's not what today's talk is about. Today's talk is about what are the physical properties of these funny modes that might impact Raman scattering. So let's get back to that. Uh, let's first talk about the first property that's kind of interesting. Here's an experiment where I take a single mode fiber and I shine the output of it onto a camera. I split it into left circular polarization and right circular polarization so that I can see both the circular polarizations. And this movie that I just ran, let me run it again. This movie that I just ran where light shifted from left to right is essentially an experiment where I am squeezing this fiber. We all very well know that you take a single mode fiber, you squeeze that fiber, you bend the fiber, and light moves from left to right circular polarization. The polarization is not stable. Why is it not stable? Because these are degenerate states. Again, because the effective index is very small, or rather zero 
effective index difference is zero. And so they kind of mix with each other. Now, if I try to do the same experiment with these orbital angular momentum modes, here's an experiment with L equals 6. If you notice, the movie is running and there's a little bit of leakage, but nothing like what we saw earlier, which means that this mode is much, much more stable to bent perturbations. So to understand why, well, you know, traditionally, if I bend a fiber, I induce by refringence, and so I can convert the polarization. But now that I have an angular momentum state, I also need to do a momentum exchange from minus L to L, which basically means as I go to higher and higher L, I need to twist this fiber and have an effective twist in it, which is much harder to create. So that's what makes these stable. Now, this sounded all, um, you know, very, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a little too esoteric. Let me actually point out that this stability that I just told you about is exactly the same, or rather the physics of the equations, the equations are exactly the same as the one that prevents a spinning top from falling, which is that these modes have high orbital angular momentum. So in order for me to be able to tip them or, or, or to destroy it, having uh you know sitting on on one on a, on, a, on a pin surface uh i need to add a lot of angular momentum to it the same story is for a bicycle wheel etc cetera, etc cetera. so this basically this basically moves these modes do behave like they're carrying a lot of orbital angular momentum which is rather stable um there's another manifestation of this that i can also point out to which is that uh you know um and and and, and, and let me explain that again with, uh, with 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 gaussian states of light uh let me come into a fiber and again this doesn't have to be a fiber this could have just been some kind of a path in mid light uh, traverses and i'm going to come in with this linear polarization and you know if i go through this fiber this linear polarization maintains itself as it comes out as long as there's no birefringence yeah but now if i do the same exercise instead of rotating this in a 2d plane if i make this light beam travel in a 3d plane and given the fact that the polarization always has to be perpendicular to the uh, direction of travel i immediately find that just this 3d path alone changed the polarization of light and this was of course the very famous the result of the very famous paper by uh, pancharatnam who by the way was a a student of uh, sir c v raman Back in 1956, he wrote this seminal paper, um, which essentially pointed out that this geometric path that light takes um, adds a phase to one of the polarizations, which is the reason why a linear polarization rotates. And this phase depends on the solid angle of this 3D geometric path. Yeah. And since then, uh, um, many people have done a lot of work on it and have pointed out that this is actually not an effect just of spin angular momentum, which is essentially what Pancharatnam had found, but also of any kind of angular momentum, spin and orbital angular momentum. What that means is that if I have a mode with, um, uh, with L and uh, L equal to plus 2, and which is right circularly polarized, then let's say it picks up this geometric phase. Phi G is this Pancharatnam phase, Pancharatnam Berry phase, Berry phase, or geometric phase, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, so now if I had this mode of the other or opposite orbital angular momentum, then it would also pick up the phase, but it would be negative, which means that when I add these two together, then I essentially get this kind of a speckle pattern. Uh, but since they have opposite phases, as I move the fiber around, uh, the image pattern can itself rotate. And and you know there's a very fundamental kind of uh, phase rotation that uh, that that happens for light, uh, as uh, was initially found by Pancharatnam. And the point of orbital angular momentum states is that it essentially, since since the phase is, depends on L directly, the orbital angular momentum state essentially amplifies this effect. Okay, so let me wrap up this part of the talk where I'm telling you about singular singularities and fiber modes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera um by by summarizing what i have told you so far if i design an optical fiber correctly then the states in the optical fiber here's you know one with plus l sigma plus and different combinations of it it could be any of these states the states of these modes usually in a multi-mode fiber they're all very close to each other which means they mix with each other and by various design criteria by using 
inherent orbital angular momentum conservation rules like the spinning top by using the Pancharatnam Berry phase, I've been able to essentially separate these states um, far away from one another, which means that if I put light in any one of them, light comes out in that out of the optical fiber, which also means that if I put light into a coherent superposition of these two, um, and let's see what happens. If I put light into this coherent superposition, both of these modes have the same orbital angular momentum, in fact, the same sign, but they have opposite circular polarization or spin angular momentum, which is just a long and fancy way of saying that it has linear polarization. But now what happens when I propagate this mode? Well, since because of spin orbit coupling, they have different speeds, what effectively happens is that this beam remains in linear polarization, but rotates as it propagates in the optical fiber. And what I have described to you is essentially what's called optical activity. It's a phenomenon that we very well know exists for chiral molecules, or you can create structures with twisted fibers, metasurfaces, etc., to create chirality in an otherwise isotropic medium. But note that this happened directly in our optical fiber, which is a purely isotropic medium. And now it depends on orbital angular momentum, which means that I can completely engineer it. So with that summary, I hope what I have shown you is uh, higher order modes, you know, they do have some weird propagation properties, weird linear propagation properties, as long as we can design the fiber so that they are stable. And once we have done that, um, you know, they, they, they do these weird things like, you know, uh, have inherent chirality or have a pancharatnam phase, which is proportional to angular momentum or are just stable because, you know, like a spinning top or are separated simply because of a particle in a box analogy. Um, so that's what we have shown so far. And the fact that these are stable and they do have some weird propagation characteristics, uh, I, I'm sure you would, you would guess, would lead to some very interesting non-linear optics. And like I said today, the kind of non-linear optics I want to concentrate on is Raman scattering. OK, so let's go back and jump right into it. Here's a step index fiber. I already told you about all these states that are separated. If I go and calculate the group index and dispersion or group velocity dispersion of these, uh, one of the things I find is that the group index depends on mode order. The dispersion depends on mode order. So it really gives me a lot of different knobs with which to convert, the, you know, to change the speed at which light propagates, the how much it disperses, et cetera, et cetera depending on which mode I use, right? And, you know, for one particular mode process, I would have one um, wavelength spacing, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives me all these degrees of freedom. Uh, now let's go back and actually look at one of these effects. And I'll actually start by describing an experiment we were doing in our lab, which is how we discovered this effect. We were not expecting to see it. So it was very exciting to be able to explain the effect uh, later on, first having observed it. Um, so here's the dispersion of an LPO. I'm sorry, it is cut off here. I think it's the LPO 19 mode. Uh, the image is somehow cutting off 19. Okay, so here's the, the group index of the L equal to 19 mode, O19 mode as a function of wavelength. And I'm going to put a pulse into this, a femtosecond pulse into it. That's why it's so broadband. And the first thing we expect it to do is what we have always expected to do, which is what uh, Mitzke and Molinauer told us is that we get soliton cell frequency shifting as it propagates in the fiber. It changes its own color. Why? Because the blue part of the pulse acts as a Raman pump for the red part of the pulse and so on and so forth. It moves. Now, if you notice, in our fiber, it did the same thing right up to about somewhere here at this wavelength. But notice that I suddenly have a little bump here. And if I go and look at the next mode, which is 13 terahertz away, I find that theoretically it matches this bump quite well, actually. And then now if I go and image this bump, then I find that it's exactly one mode order lower at LPO 19. So it sounds like this mode was traveling at a certain group velocity. And the moment it hit this point where it had the same group velocity as another mode, it started transferring some energy there. So far, it's not that interesting because, you know, yeah, sure, if I have any equal group velocities, I might get scattering everywhere. But now look at this fun part as I increase power in this system. All the power disappears from my seeded stable mode 
goes completely into this new mode, and then it propagates again like solid on cell frequency shifting. This shift is what we defined or called as solid on self mode conversion, which essentially behaves like a quasi CW operation for ultra fast pulses. But the best part is it comes with 100% photon conversion. Um, so since I have many modes and different group index spacings, uh, is this a gener general phenomenon? Can it happen again and again? Well, let's look at it. Here's the pump. Here's the first shifting I get. And then after that, I get the next mode. And then as it moves further and further, each time it matches the group index of another mode, it jumps and then it propagates it solves on cell frequency shifting, jumps again, propagate, jumps again, et cetera, et cetera. It really be stopped at 1600 only because we started the experiment with 12 meters of fiber. If it started with much longer, it might have just come, uh, gone on till the point where silica fiber itself became uh, lossy. Okay, so now let's go and look at this in a little more detail. Here's actually some simulations we did in early on this, which is that we started with this pump, yeah, and 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 you know here's the group index of the pump mode and the Stokes mode, etc. Cetera, et cetera, these two different modes. Um, so what's happening here is that as it starts propagating, you notice that the pump is propagating a certain distance, and immediately right there you saw this new mode show up. But here's the important part, right? The blue part of the pump disappeared, everything became red, which means that indeed the salt on self mode conversion process won over the salt on self frequency shift process, which, you know, uh, in case that sounds like too many alphabet soups there, uh, the main point I want you to take away from this is that a spontaneous process, a noise initiated process, actually won over the seeded process, which is which is quite amazing. And all of that, all, the only reason that could happen is because I have multiple modes so that I have this group velocity dispersion with which I could absolutely ensure that a pump and a Stokes had exactly the same group velocity for this to happen. Uh, we actually experimentally confirmed that is the case by just doing, you know, uh, interferometry measurements where we basically take two, um, you know, two uh, pulses um, uh, de delayed by a certain pulse width and interfere them. If I look at the pump, it's highly coherent, which means it's a, a, these are coherent pulses. If I look at SSFS, which is a seeded process, it's still coherent. And then if I look at SSMC, then I indeed find that it's shot to shot, completely incoherent, which means it's completely noise initiated, which basically goes to prove that there's a completely quantum noise initiated process. But for some reason, a quantum noise initiated process which is supposed to remain only in the spontaneous regime because of the group velocity matching completely kills the uh, seeded process. Um, well, again, you know, I can change the size of the fiber, change the spacing, and by changing the spacing, I can create not just two co one color, I can create three colors spontaneously, and all of them, the nice thing is that they are time synchronized because it's a group velocity matching phenomenon. I could go even crazier. I could use four modes and essentially get all of them synchronized. So the idea is that, you know, I can do a lot of things because of group velocity matching between modes rather than group velocity matching or group velocity engineering for one mode. Now, for those of you who have done single mode nonlinear fiber optics, either with photonic crystal fibers or otherwise, will immediately realize that what I'm essentially describing here is instead of using fiber design to do dispersion control, what we can do is use multiple modes to do dispersion control and essentially get a Raman process, which would otherwise not exist in bulk media. Um, what have we used this for? Well, like I said, I do this in, 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 in large motor area fibers, which basically means I can get a lot of power out of this. Uh, the, uh, the maximum we've been able to get out of these fibers is 1.1 megawatts at 1300 nanometers. 1.1 um, megawatts is a lot of power. Remember that unlike other fiber lasers, um, we don't need any compression because this is actually the soliton that comes straight out of the fiber, um, which obviously makes it very useful for doing uh, remote delivery, as well as endoscopic applications. Here's the first set of applications we did. We took that, converted with an axicon into a Gaussian because of course a microscope wants not this crazy mode, but a Gaussian. Um, and then we did some microscopy with mouse brains, essentially found that if I look at the dendrites in this, um, they are 1.2 microns, which essentially means it's an 
diffraction limited system, which means this highly complex mode is actually highly spatially coherent. Um, and uh, the, we since then we have used them to do uh, you know nerve imaging uh, such that we could use both second harmonic and third harmonic generation in these systems. Okay, so now let me move to the next uh, um, other property that I described earlier in the linear regime and how that might dis uh, affect Moravian scattering. Um, so this is orbital angular momentum. So just to, again, to quickly recap, orbital angular momentum modes uh, are a little different from other modes in an optical fiber, uh, because note that they all, have these all these modes, this is the intensity profile. They all have similar intensity profiles. Their phases might be different, but their intensity profiles are very similar, right? Which means, again, the dispersion depends on orbital angular momentum. But the important thing is because I have all these modes with different effective indices, uh, my nonlinear overlap integral, because they're all similar, is very high. Uh, the, uh, the OEM conservation is needed in order to get uh, any kind of nonlinearity, and then I need polarization conservation at least, right? So it allows me to have a lot of Fourier mixing phase matching possibilities. And here's an example of where I have this mode. I put a pump in two of these modes. And indeed, depending on the kind of phase matching I get, I can get uh, Stokes and anti-Stokes uh, matching uh, with full on orbital angular momentum conservation between different pairs of modes. And this is actually very useful because I can do it over the entire wavelength range. I can use it to do parametric amplification. We've shown that you can get kilowatt uh, nanosecond pulses out of at any wavelength that we would like uh, with orbital angular momentum states. Um, but this is Fourier mixing, electronic nonlinearity. The reason I went so quickly through it is because this is not what I want to concentrate on today. Um, but instead, let's go back and look at it a little in a little more detail. Here's a spectrum that I just told you about. I pump with the circular polarization L equal to 21, uh, right circular polarization light. I get a certain spectrum due to Fourier mixing. I pump it with linear polarization. I get a slightly different polarization, you know, uh, set of uh, um, uh, um, Fourier mixing peaks only because the phase matchings are different for the two polarizations. But now let's look at the Raman. And there are two things that we immediately notice for the Raman is that the Raman scattering due to this pump happens in all the modes, right? Because this is this is this this classic tilted lens image tells me how many singularities I have. I have no singularities and plus or minus, which means it occurs in all the modes, uh, which is exactly what we would expect because, you know, Raman scattering should not depend on orbital angular momentum of light, right? It should not depend on phases. So it shows up in all the modes. But here, right here, you notice another thing. If I come in with linearly polarized light, that same Raman shows up in all the modes, but it's 20 dB suppressed. Which is really, really strange because every nonlinear optics book that you would open would tell you that Raman scattering does not depend on the polarization of the initial pump. Raman scattering will happen into the same polarization as that of the pump, but it doesn't depend on whether the polarization of the pump is linear or circular. Right? In fact, both Raman and Brunoan scattering arising from phonon vibrations is fundamentally not known to depend on polarization. I've just shown you an experiment where it does. Okay, so what's going on? Um, let's go and analyze this. This is, I'm showing you only the spectrum of the Raman scattering pump power. This is the pump in the L equal to 15 mode with left circularly polarized, sorry, right circularly polarized light. You know, that's a simple mode it propagates and I get strokes in all the modes. This is exactly what I expect. But now, suppose I have the pump in the linear polarization mode and let's look at some other stokes mode any other mode for that matter including the mode which has the same pump um, well linear polarization remember leads to this polarization rotation this chirality this uh, optical activity that i described earlier or rather optical rotation well the optical rotation depends on l and wavelength which means for these two different cases, the pump and stokes, the rotation rates are very different. Let me actually run that animation again. The blue, the red is the pump and the green is the, is the stokes. Yeah? And since they walk off, Raman is completely suppressed. 
More interestingly, what this means is that there must be one particular L at this wavelength difference where everything exactly matches and note is that there is indeed one set wavelength for a particular wavelength, for a particular L, I get the same rotation rate that happens only at that specific wavelength, right? And it doesn't happen outside, so depending on, you know, that's why the, the, the bandwidth is reduced. So right here, I've actually described something very, very powerful and unexpected for Raman scattering, which is that depending on the pump, so if the, if, if, you know, if, if the pump is uh, uh, in any one of these modes, then, you know, I get for the same circular polarization, I get all of this. For linear polarization, I get this for the sum. But if I look at the amount that I get in that one polar, the orbital angular momentum, which is one step away, I get complete phase matching and I get this Raman scattering behavior that depends on the orbital angular momentum. To give you uh, a further uh, proof that these are phase matched, this is the K vector difference between the pump and the Stokes, uh, which effectively looks like a phase matching equation. Let's go back and look at second harmonic generation. We have that classic phase matching equation. What that tells us is that if something is phase matched, then its bandwidth depends on the length of the crystal or the medium. And sure, here we find that here's our simulation of delta k as a function of wavelength for a nine meter long, for a 10 meter long fiber and 20 meter long fiber. And we indeed find that, uh, you know, the bandwidths over which I get uh, conversion uh, differ. And here's our experiment. Notice that in our experiment, it almost completely matches the bandwidth for the fiber that was half as long was almost twice as much as the other one. So this clearly shows that it's a chirality mediated bandwidth that I can control. So in summary, if I have circular polarization, Raman scattering in optical fibers behaves the same way as it has always behaved. Um, but the moment I have this optical active state, which is simply linear polarization, I not only get suppression for most of the other modes, I get also get, um, sorry, I, I got strong suppression for all these other modes which is a very important thing. We're trying to use it for applications. We're gonna use this to reduce noise and entanglement sources because Raman, in spite of the fact that it's very, very good for a lot of things, is actually the thing that prevents us from developing low noise fiber quantum entangled sources. Um, but then it also has this phase matching relationship for one particular angular momentum where I get uh, Raman scattering, and that can happen at any wavelength across this whole range, which means that we get tunability in Raman scattering wavelength, as well as tunability on its strength. And we hope that this could play a role in creating new kind of engineered sources, um, using the fact that we can now dispersion engineer uh, Raman gain. That brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, I hope uh, what I uh, showed you today is uh, that um, spatial modes with all these weird singularities and fibers have some very unique properties. Specifically, the two unique properties that I spent time on today is this, this funny chirality that it induces for itself and its mode dependent speeds or dispersions, et cetera, et cetera. And because of that, um, what we find is uh, uh, that we can actually access new forms of Raman scattering selection rules. The first one I talked about is soliton self-mode conversion, which is essentially an interplay of group velocity and the spatial structure of light. Um, from a physics perspective, it is interesting because it's a noise-initiated process that somehow wins over a seeded process. We always learned in all our laser textbooks that, you know, if you have some spontaneous noise happening as long as the moment you seed it, that is the process that wins. But here I'm actually telling you the opposite. Um, so that's the interesting physics behind this. Uh, the interesting application of it is that we can go to ridiculously high pump powers, oh, sorry, uh, powers at colors and multiple colors as desired simply by designing a fiber. And the other thing that uh, I discussed had to do with this chirality, this inherent chirality, effectively uh, controls which mode I get Raman in. And now Raman scattering depend, becomes 
proportional or not proportional to, but dependent on the orbital angular momentum that light carries, which gives us you know one more new degree of freedom with which to control it, either to suppress it in places like quantum entanglement where I want to get rid of it, or to move it around in places where I want to use it to build a laser at specific payments. Um, a lot of this work would not have been, I'm sorry, all of this work would not have been possible uh, uh, had it not been for a very dedicated and uh, bright team of young scientists in my lab. Here are all the students that are around right now, including the postdocs. And here are, all, uh, here are some that worked in related projects that have graduated since. A lot of this work would also not have been possible had it not been for uh, the fantastic collaborations that I've, we have been very fortunate to have from across the world. And also, um, we would like to. I would like to thank the funding agencies to have made this possible. But more importantly, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I will go back to the summary slide and leave it there, and end my talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now the platform is open for discussion. You may please unmute and uh, can interact with the speaker. See, the, the modes you are getting, the modes I am unitionized, the modes you are getting, yeah. they are separated by 18 terahertz. Those modes we can make use of. Yeah, so I mean, they're separated here by, uh, so the modes themselves are not separated by 18 terahertz. The, um, um, the uh, the Raman scattering that happens due to the soliton self mode conversion that is separated by 13 terahertz and that depends only on silica. That's a material property. So if you did this in a different material, there would be a different separation. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Sir, how this one is uh, getting applied in uh, communication? Fiber optic uh, communication. That's that's a very good question. Actually, today everything that I presented uh, is decidedly not something that we are using for communications. Um, the uh, soliton self mode conversion aspect is something that we are using for doing uh, uh, biomedical imaging because it essentially allows us to create very very high peak power fire. So to give you an idea out of optical fibers people have been able to create frequency converted fm to second pulses of up to somewhere close to you know a, tens of picojoules directly out of a fiber and here we have been able to create up to 80 to 100 nanojoules so you know it's it's almost three orders of magnitude more power at the wavelength we want and the interest in doing that is obviously in biology because then i can do multi-photon microscopy um the Raman suppression thing that I told you about uh, is not being applied to optical communications as in a classical optical communications, but we have some preliminary results. We're not yet ready to uh, present them, but hopefully we will be able to present them in about another six months time, which demonstrate that this Raman suppression that you get due to chirality can directly be used to increase the uh, uh, the noise free um, entanglement source generation for quantum communication. So I think the first place where we would apply them in at all, if at all in communications is would be more for quantum networking. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, it was a very nice talk, exciting talk. I'm Mamta from Pages Department. So actually, I, I would go back to the summary slide where you uh, mentioned that a few of the things like uh, special modes. So you talked something about that noise initiated process where you mm -hmm. see more regularity, regular kind of behavior. So is it like, uh, means it uh, does it happen like at a particular temperature or something? I mean, no, so why you would say that? Yes, that's, just... a good, that's a very good question. So why does a noise initiated process dominate over or win over a seated process, right? That's your question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so that that's actually a very good question. It, it actually bothered us for a long time. 
bother us enough that we were we we weren't absolutely sure whether we we were right about our 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 our, um, our uh, understanding of why this this thing is happening. And uh, but but since then we have done a lot of measurements and theoretical simulations, so we know for, for sure. Okay, so hmm. let's go back to this slide. Uh, can you see this slide in presentation mode, or uh, I just want to make sure you guys can you? Yeah, yeah, it is yeah. visible. Okay, it's uh, this is the slide that says influence of modal dispersion on Raman. Do you, is that is that the one you're seeing also? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so yeah, so the, here's my dispersion curve. So let me go. So now what happened here? Is that up to this point I was getting a seeded process, right? All of these pulses that I get are seeded, uh, self-seeded processes. Why are they self-seeded? Because this part of the pump, the pulse pumps this part of the pulse, which means I get Raman shifting, which is you know the classic soliton cell frequency shifting. It is this place. Notice that there's this light, this small thing. This is what soliton self mode conversion is, and it starts. And it completely takes over at this point. Notice that this pulse is gone, and only this pulse is there, right? Oh, In yes. fact, we saw that here also. This is the original pump that created this one. And then it's gone. Now I have this one. And then it's gone. Now I have this next mode. It's gone, right? I complete, I mean, this is this is an actual measurement. Here's the power measured in the lab, right? There's no more power left in this mode. All of it is gone here. And then at some point, it's suddenly. So what are all these points where this happens? Yeah, right. That was your question. Is there is is it a temperature? No, it's not a temperature related thing. What exactly these points are? Uh, these are the points where the group index of the pulse in this mode exactly matches the group index of the right. pulse. Exactly. Yes. And, and and that, so that is a kind of like a resonance. You mean like a synchronization happens? So. Yeah, but I mean resonance. I would I would be careful. I wouldn't call it a resonance. I would call it a group velocity. See, because resonance implies phase velocity matching. This is group velocity mm -hmm. matching. Yeah. Okay. I see. So it's uh, I, I, for lack of a better word, I would just call it group velocity matching, or rather call it self salt on self mode conversion. Yeah, it's a kind of group velocity. You mean that energy also? Yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. and and that's what makes it exciting because group velocity tailoring is what we know how to do in any medium. It doesn't have to be a fiber in any medium, as long as I have two different spatial modes. And I can tailor the group velocity differences, then I can make this effect happen at the wavelength I want, the number of times I want, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Any more question? Okay. Um, I have one. Uh, I mean, um, if we were to use uh, this process for generating a continuum, continuum radiation out of a fiber, yeah. Uh, would it be in the same process or shall we adjust some parameters to get uh, ah, this good question so we have done uh, um, super continuum generation with these fibers and super continuum generation basically follows the same rules as what we see in photonic crystal fibers except that now i can generate it in exactly the same mode uh, over the whole range and i can generate it in the same polarization and i can generate it with high energy mm -hmm. energy pump powers the reason I didn't present that today is that the rules that that follows are exactly the same old Raman scattering rules. I, I wanted to spend time today talking about the you know the weird effects that I do not expect from uh, uh, you know I open a textbook and say okay this is what Raman scattering should do for me for these fibers and these modes. These are two examples to my knowledge um, which are you know relatively recent examples. One was published in 2019 and. One was published actually just a few months ago, the chirality one, uh, which are not what I would have expected. But the continuum happens just like in any other fiber. If you have dispersion zero, you put sort of polarization, it happens. Okay, in that case, how, how do you distinguish whether it is a Raman process or some other? Oh, well, I mean, as you know, in a, in, a, in, quant in continuum, uh, it's an interplay of Raman and Fourier mixing, right? So it's essentially, a continuum is happening when I have jacked up the pump power enough that you get Raman, then Raman creates Fourier mixing, and then Fourier mixing creates its own Raman, and it's a cascaded process that fills up the whole thing. So the answer to the technical answer to your question would be every one of these things I did showed you, especially for ultra fast pulses, if I just increase the pump power, it would happen. Right. Oh. right. At high enough pump power, there is no unique process left, right? Everything happens. Right? 
so so and, and what about coherence i mean you lose coherence so uh, you... um that's a good question i think in the uh, in if you use soliton self mode conversion then you will lose coherence altogether but if you're in a regime where you have only soliton self frequency shifting then 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 you don't lose coherence so okay. in fact uh, i can uh, since this is a rather uh, unique uh, um, platform where i can also can you see my new slides since i can usually not do this if i'm in a conference room but here i can actually just open up all my other slides also can you see this new slide no i know it is the same oh yeah right okay. yeah yeah so here's an example of what we did earlier and like i said i didn't present these results today um, so here's the pump. It's an ultra fast pump, right? As long as mm -hmm. I can, I can. Once a continuum starts, that continuum essentially fills up this whole space. It's in the same polarization, exact same thing, and goes over an entire octave. And it's exactly the same mode and the same polarization throughout. And what that tells us that we haven't measured the coherence for this, but we measured the coherence for the for related process, and they're basically as coherent as the pump that we started with. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. If no more questions, we can conclude. OK. Now I request Dr. Raji K. Dhaman to propose auto thanks. Nice talk, Siddharth. Good evening, all. Thank you. We have reached the end of today's webinar session. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks for this great event organized by Taman International Operonics Society, RIOS. On behalf of the RIOS and the entire organizing team of ROS 2022, I extend very hearty vote of thanks to our speaker, Professor Siddharth Ramachandran, High Dimensional United States of America, for gracing your important work and sharing with us your findings and opinions towards the talk on new Raman scattering selection rules at singular light. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation for you, sir, for giving excellent coverage to the topics such as ultra-fast pulses, mode coupling in fibers, influence of model dispersion on Raman, salt on self-mode conversion. Once again, we thank you, sir, for your outstanding presentation. A special thanks to the chairpersons, vice chairpersons, secretaries, and advisory committee members for their constant encourage, support, and coordination to make this webinar successful. Our sincere gratitude and thanks to all the eminent personalities, Professor VP Mahadevan Pillai, former Vice Chancellor of University of Kerala, Professor Humberto Caprera, Professor Vishnu Pal, Dr. Jayasri, Professor Dharambir, Professor VP Nambudi, Professor Unikrishnan Nair, and other professors, faculties, and students from India and abroad for their active participation. Thank you all for making today's event successful with your contribution. All the participants are requested to submit their feedback form today itself before 10 p.m. IST. The link to the feedback form is available in the chat box. Our next webinar will be on Tuesday, 8 November 2022 at 7 p.m. IST on the topic Surface Enhanced Diamond Spectroscopy for the Diagnosis of Neurodegenerative Disease and Cancer Progression by Dr. R.S. Jayasri, 